So my why now is I on a mission to help everyone get out of what I call solo, solo. economic okay. dependency, which means if they're not personally working, they're not making any money. They don't scale. It's a one to one. Mm -hmm. So if you got a job, if you're self employed, you know, think doctors, lawyers, right? Think about your dentist. They're, if the dentist's hands aren't in somebody's mouth, they don't generate any income. So we want to eliminate subtle economic dependency. And so there's nothing more gratifying for me professionally than when someone comes up to me and says, Mark, you changed my life. Hello and welcome to the Lewis and Kyle Show, an interview podcast where my friend Lewis and I interview incredible entrepreneurs, investors, technologists, and people living high leverage lives. We release an evergreen episode once a week, and we're glad that you're here. In this episode, we interview the land geek, Mark Podolsky. He is the author of a book about buying land and how to make money doing that in all sorts of ways called Dirt Rich, which is available on Audible, Amazon, all the major book places. He also hosts a podcast. He not only teaches people about the process of making money, buying and selling land, he also runs a company where he still does that called Frontier Equities. I wrote an abbreviation for this and don't totally know how the abbreviation fully expands. So we'll leave that in the show notes, but it's something like Frontier Equity Properties. He's done over 5,000 unique transactions, different land type trades. And in this episode, we cover his system. So how does he find deals? What even is a deal in this type of business? What are the tax implications? What are his favorite markets? We discuss why he doesn't do any other type of real estate, which I found to be very interesting and not something I expected. And towards the end, we get into both his life and business philosophy, which is surprisingly zen based on the first 30 minutes of the interview. But I mean that in the best of ways. I'm excited for you to listen to this episode. I must jump in and say the past couple of weeks, Kyle and I have not been doing the very best job of one every single week, but you know what? We're doing a good job and on average, we're at one a week. So thanks so much for listening. Excited that you're here. Let's switch over to our episode with Mark Land Geek right now. Enjoy. Mark, welcome to the Lewis and Kyle show. We are very excited for this conversation. We've done a lot of podcasts about real estate, but none about buying land, which is your area of expertise. So welcome to the show. We're excited. Lewis, Kyle, thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. My first question is just your background, your story. How did you get into buying land in the first place? Let's just kind of run through how the how and why you got to where you are. So we're going to rewind the tape um, to the year 2000. I don't know if you guys were even born yet. It was the year I was born. And I was, I was working as a uh, micromanaged, high stress, miserable, 45 minute commute and work and back investment banker specializing in mergers and acquisitions with private equity groups. And guys, it got so bad for me. I wouldn't get the Sunday blues anticipating Monday coming around. I'd get the Friday blues anticipating the weekend going by really fast and having to be back at work on Monday. So my firm hires this guy. He's telling me that as a side hustle, he's buying up raw land, pennies on the dollar. He's flipping them online and he's making a 300% return on his investment. Well guys, I'm looking at companies all day long and a great company, great, has 15% EBITDA margins or free cash flow. Your average company is 10% and I'm looking at companies all day long, less than 10%. So of course, I don't believe him. I've got ten. Uh, I've got three grand saved up for car repairs, and I go to New Mexico with him. I do exactly what he says. I buy up ten half-acre parcels, an average price of three hundred dollars each, and then I sell them all, and I get an average price of twelve hundred dollars each. It worked three hundred percent. So I took all that money, and I live in Arizona, and there's you know it's two thousand. There's no one in the room at this auction. I buy up land and acreage for nothing. And then over the next six months, I sold all that property and I made over $90,000 cash. So I go to my wife and she's pregnant. I'm like, honey, I'm going to quit my job and become a full-time land investor. And she's like, absolutely not. So I said, okay, okay. So it took me about 18 months for the land investing income to exceed the investment banking income. And then I quit. I've been doing it full-time ever since. I've done over 6,000 deals uh, to date, and I absolutely love it. Yeah, that's an incredible uh, start. So what is the model? Like, you know, it sounds great, but it sounds sort of like 
okay, I can just go do this right now. It's like, so what is the, I guess, trick? What are you, what are you doing with the land? Yeah, let's, let's, let's do it. So Kyle Lewis, where do you guys live? I'm in Las Vegas, but we'll see how much longer that lasts. Henderson, Las Vegas, Nevada. I'm in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, born and raised in Birmingham, Alabama. Okay. So Tuscaloosa, Alabama and, and Nevada. Yeah. I'm going to assume that you guys both own together 10 acres of raw land in Texas. And you guys owe $200 in back taxes. So essentially you're advertising two very important things to me. Number one, you have no emotional attachment to that raw land, Vegas, Alabama. And number two, you're distressed financially in some weird way because when we don't pay for things. We don't value them in the same way. You guys haven't paid your property taxes. As a result, the county treasurer keeps sending you notices saying, Kyle Lewis, don't pay your property taxes. We're going to auction this property to a tax deed or a tax lien investor. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to get that property before it goes to auction. And I'm going to look at the lowest comparable sale on your 10 acre property for the last 12 to 18 months. So let's say, for example, the lowest comp is $10,000. All I'm going to do is divide by four. And that's going to get me what Warren Buffett would call a 300% margin of safety. So I'm going to send you an actual offer of $2,500. Now you guys accept it. Now, because for you, $2,500 is better than nothing. Now in reality, three to 5% of people accept my quote unquote top dollar offer. Hmm. But that's an important metric because I know if I've come into a, a, a dynamic market and I'm getting less than a 3% response rate, I've got to re-up my offer. I've got to raise my offer for the market to respond. Now, if it's over 5%, I start getting nervous and I probably came in too high in the marketplace. And then during due diligence, I'm going to have to retrade, but we'll get to that point. So now that you've accepted the offer, I have to go through due diligence for this in-depth research. So what's the most important thing I have to do? Number one, I have to confirm back taxes are only $200. Number two, I have to confirm you guys still even own the property. Number three, I have to make sure there's no breaks in the chain of title. Number four, I have to make sure there's no liens or encumbrances, clouding title. I wanna find out what's compelling about the property. What are the roads like? How far from services? So I have this whole big property uh, checklist. I outsource to my team in the Philippines. We pay $11. They're connected to an American title company. Now, if I'm investing 5,000 or more, then I'll go through traditional title company. But this is only $2,500, so I'll self-close this deal. So what I'm gonna do is go through due diligence, everything checks out. I send you guys a check for $2,500. Now I own the property. I'm gonna sell this property 30 days or less, and I'm gonna make a cash flow like a rental home. So I have a built-in best buyer. Do you guys know who it is? No. The their government. neighbor. Not the government, Lewis. Their, their neighbor? The neighbor, you got it, the neighbor. So I'm gonna send out neighbor letters saying, hey guys, here's your opportunity. Know your neighbor, protect your privacy, protect your views. Oftentimes the neighbors will buy it. Now if they pass, I'll go to my buyer's list. If my buyer's list passes, I'll go to a little website you guys have probably never heard of. It's called Craigslist. It's the 10th most trafficked website in the United States. I'll go to one I know you've heard of, Facebook, uh, the marketplace, buy sell groups. And then I'll go to the lands, landmoto.com, landandfarm.com, uh, landsofamerica.com landflip.com, landhub.com. These are all these platforms where people buy and sell raw land. But the magic is I'm going to make it irresistible for that new buyer. And the way that I'm going to make it irresistible is I'm going to make it easy. So all I'm going to ask for is a $2,500 down payment to control this 10 acre parcel. So I want to get my money out as fast as possible. I could go even six to 10 months out. And then I'm just gonna make it a car payment. Let's say two forty nine a month at nine percent interest for the next eighty four months. So it's a one time sale. I get my money out on the down, and now I've got two hundred forty nine dollars a month coming in every single month 
with no renters, no rehabs, no renovations, no rodents. And because I'm not dealing with a tenant, I'm exempt from Dodd-Frank, RESPA, and the SAFE Act, all this onerous real estate legislation. And then the game that we play is can we create enough of these land notes where our passive income now exceeds our fixed expenses and we're working because we want to, not because we have to. So you're buying cash, buying the land cash from an auction or from an off-market seller, just finding deals in general. You're sending a ton of LOIs, as pretty much as many as you can get out the door. And then you close the deal um, at already a good price, a, a, a fourth of what I guess is the market. The market is saying that it should be sold for. And then you sell it to your list of buyers or the neighbors, hopefully the neighbor, on basically they're buying it fr from you as a seller finance deal. And so you get all your cash out on the, on the first bite from them and then they pay you a, a, a mortgage basically on that land for um, w whatever the predisclosed, whatever the negotiated terms are. Exactly. Now, is when we're making our offers, what I always advise my clients to do when they first get started is 20 offers a day. Now, the reason that is, is if I said to you guys, hey, you're going to start a new workout regimen. I want you guys to work out two hours every day. You'll be exhausted and you'll probably burn out. Well, if you start making a thousand offers a day, your team is not built to handle that kind of due diligence when the offers come back. You also won't have the capital, most likely, to close all those deals. But 20 offers a day is going to be something that you can handle. And it also allows you to see your response rates and you know, really save money on your mailing uh, investment. So can you talk a little bit about the process of actually finding the deal and submitting that LOI? Like what is that, you know, sending 20 in one day, it sort of sounds daunting. It's like, do I just Google land for sale and then, and then find the owner of that land and find their address and send them a, a letter with an LOI? Right. So the first thing we're going to do is get that list. We'll go to the county assessor. Okay. That's a public information of all the people that own real property in that county. Then we're gonna do two scrubs. The first scrub is gonna be by use code. Let's say it's VL for vacant land. And now we've got all the vacant land in that county. Then we're gonna do one more scrub or batch by assessor's parcel number, APN number. That's gonna be by neighborhood and sometimes acreage. Because if I send Lewis, who's got 40 acres, the same offer as Kyle, who's got five acres in that same county, Lewis is going to send me back glitter in the mail. No good. So we want to then price the list. So we're going to go through our comps, our comparable sales, the last 12, 18 months, take the lowest comparable sale, divide by four, put that into our software. So we're going to use a software called LG Pass that will automate this entire process. So we're, all going, to, we're going to upload our list into lgpass.com. We're going to then price our list, and then the mail will automatically go out mm. using the software. We can then reprice, or we can set up a drip function in LG Pass, and if we have to then reprice it, we can do it by dollar amount or percentage-wise in the software. My business philosophy being, my life philosophy being actually, I can always make more money, but I can't get more time. So anything that will save me time, I'm going to invest in. So the software is then going to save me time. Then once the due diligence, or once the, the, the offers come back, we're going to start doing our due diligence and doing that as well. What is the due diligence uh, time frame that you include in that offer? We want to close in seven days. Wow. Money loves speed. <laughs> I guess that's part of the reason why you can offer a fourth of the price because if you find distressed sellers and they see seven day closing rather than 60, they're much more apt to get the bank, get the cash out. Absolutely. We close fast. Are you looking at any geographic restrictions? So are you looking just for your local county? Or are you buying these, you know, sight unseen 
thousand miles away. Like, what's that have to do with it? Where's right. that factor? I mean, in? Lewis, let's let's just pick on Kyle for for yeah. a minute here, okay? Okay, let's just be honest, right? Nobody wakes mm-hmm. up and thinks to themselves, "Boy, I'd like some raw land in Alabama today," unless you live in Alabama. No, I've I've been to Alabama. There's it's some beautiful. Nice, some, yeah, I was gonna say it's beautiful. It's beautiful. It is, but it's it's the Midwest, right? But if I said Nevada, Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, Oregon, Washington, Texas, California, Florida, these are the sunshine states. These are fast growing states. And these states have an abundance of inexpensive raw land. That's not to say I wouldn't do a deal in Alabama or Missouri or Tennessee or Arkansas. Again, these are beautiful areas. But my biggest buyer pool is going to be in the southwest, a little bit in the northwest, California, and Florida. That's really where we want to focus on. I mean, you know, I don't look at the raw land anymore. I can't tell you the last time I went to go look at a deal. It all kind of looks the same. So it's scalable. You can do this from anywhere in the world. All you need is an inexpensive computer and an internet connection. You're in business. That's how many huge. This is the, now we're asking the, the downside questions and the, you know, have you had any things not sell? Have you been stuck with any land you haven't wanted? What's the kind of the possible downsides, possible things that can go wrong and or mitigation strategies? Right. So because we're buying, we're making our money on the buy. So as long as we're not overpaying, it's, it's really, really almost impossible to lose because you're buying at 25, 30 cents a dollar. Even if you have to flip it, you'll still make a hundred percent return on your money, right? Cause you're leaving enough meat on the bone for the retailer. If you have to wholesale it after 6,000 deals, I've never lost money on a deal. It's kind of crazy. My worst deal was when I factored in my time. I did a deal in this area of Western Pennsylvania called Treasure Lake, and it was gated, and it had two PGA-rated golf courses and three lakes, and they had million-dollar homes, and I loved it. But it had HOA fees, and it was in Pennsylvania. So I went in there, and I'm like, you guys have a 1,000 lots sitting in the county. The taxes haven't been paid. The HOA fees haven't been paid. This is dead money. I'm going to come in. I'm going to buy up all the lots. I'm going to sell all those lots for you. I'm going to make it live again. You'd think, wow, great deal. Dead money, live money. County benefits, they start getting tax revenue. The property owners association benefits, they start getting their property owners fees. But no, they didn't like it. The golfers were like, oh my gosh, we're going to have to wait for tea times. The people on the lake are like, There's, we're going to be filled with boats. So there's all these political factions in the POA. It took me three years to negotiate this deal. Three years. Finally, I bought all the properties for 50 bucks each. I started selling them, making them live deals. Well, this is in 2006. Well, guess what happens in 2007? The bubble pops. Bubble pops, nobody wants it. I made 100 grand on that deal. Um, But when I factored in my time, that's the first deal I broke I really feel like I broke even on when I factored in my time. Mm-hmm. What were you pricing your time at? If you don't mind me asking to like make that. I, well, at that point in time, I was, you know, I was probably right now. I, I, I you know, I, I, my, my hourly rates like 5,000 an hour. Um, a few years ago it was like 3000 an hour. I bet you at that time it was maybe a thousand dollars an hour. Okay. That just helps us, uh, convert the math. So yeah. is the reason you're able to say you've not had a bad deal, just the fact that you've been in the game for 20 years and there's just been enough time for bad deals to turn into okay deals? No, I mean, it's just the, the nature of that market. It's just when you buy an asset. I mean, if I, if I made you an offer right now on everything in your garage, 25 cents a dollar, you guys would probably sell everything in the garage and I would flip it to somebody that, that mm-hmm. wanted it. So it's just, it's just the market. Um, I did a deal in New Mexico, 40 acres, um, I paid twenty five hundred dollars. It was on the side of a mountain. I screwed up my due diligence. I mean, it was like fifteen acres were, were only accessible. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, this is terrible. So I put it up on eBay at a dollar no reserve auction for ten days. Well, the first day it got bid up to twenty five hundred dollars. 
by the tenth day, it's at thirty two thousand five hundred dollars, and I'm freaking out. And I'm like, maybe I, I, you know, I'm, I'm misrepresenting the property in some way. Maybe they're misunderstanding the the aerial map or the plat map. Something's wrong. So the guy wins the auction. I call him up immediately. I'm like, hey, you realize, like, of these forty acres, only fifteen are accessible, right? I'm like, y- y- I didn't misrepresent anything. He's like, no, it's perfect. I'm like, well, what are you gonna do with the property? He's like, well, I'm a film director in L.A. And I'm going to film out there. And the county's been so difficult to deal with, it's cheaper and saving more time and money just to buy the land than it is to deal with the county getting a permit to film. So I learned very quickly, there's a pig for every barn. Absolutely. How do you get over the, um, I guess, like, I don't know how to ask this correctly, but the social implications of making such a low offer, like, and, and dealing with rejection in general, like, how do you, how do you think about that? Well, when I first started, I got a Google voice account. So if people were going to yell at me, I would just not even listen to it. I would just transcribe it. Um, you, it's just like anything else you get, you, you build thick skin in business. Mm -hmm. Um, you gotta, you know, it's just, you just gotta get your, get your reps in, honestly. Um, and sometimes it's funny. Like you wouldn't believe the things that people will write. Like they'll take their time to write. Like, you know, if I get a credit card off for the mail, I don't like, I don't write them back. Hey, I, I hope American express goes under. <laughs> yeah. That's just wasting you know, your own time. I just, right. I just throw the, the offer away. But one day maybe I want a credit card and it's there. Yeah, absolutely. So what are your, Kyle, did you have a question? No, go for it. You keep I was cutting ask, in and out, Lewis, like your video does. That's fine. Uh, it's record separately, combines at the end, so it'll look good for the people watching. Perfect. But my question was, what's starting look like for you've been in the game a long time? You have a team in the Philippines. You have, you know, lots of bruises and mistakes you've made that you know to avoid. What's starting look like for someone who, let's say, has three thousand dollars? So for $3,000, it's a great starting point. All you're going to do is make some offers and just follow that recipe. So you first you want to get trained, right? Um, I've got a, a course, uh, thelandgeek.com forward slash quick deals, and it's a free course. And it teaches you how to double your money 30 days or less. So first get trained by someone who's done it a bunch. And then once you start making money, then you can go into the deeper pieces of the business because you have more confidence. Yeah, absolutely. Go so to the website. Three thousand dollars buys you a buys you some acres in one of the sunshine states that someone's gonna want to buy. Within, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Have you dabbled in any other types of real estate or only um, you know, only land? In 2005, a buddy and I bought a house in Carefree, Arizona. And if you remember the housing market then, um, it was crazy. We made a hundred grand on a on a house flip. But again, at that point in time, I was factoring my time into three thousand dollars an hour. So when I factored in my time, I didn't make nearly the return as I did in land investing. I'm going meeting the contractors, you know, it was just a miserable, miserable process. So after that, I decided no more shiny object syndrome. I ignore everything else. So I'm an inch wide and a mile deep. I only buy and sell raw land. It's what I love to do. It's what I'm pretty good at. No need to do any other real estate investing or any other. I mean, I guess I do some other investing which we talked about before, like, you know, I'm kind of getting into crypto, but it's only because I kind of like the, the asset appeals to me. And, um, it's just very, it, 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 it feels like, like a, like a raw land deal to me. Um, there's also you know, no contractors and county commission yeah, and all that. There's no contractors, you, just, you, no just, you buy it, you sell it. There's the immediate liquidity. It's a, right. Yeah, it's, it's tough yeah. to use the I word mean, investing I, the same way for both of those because one's more active. This is just like, I think, number go up, so I'm going to buy some. Right, right. Yeah, yeah exactly. You know, it's a, it's a form of currency and, right, inflation hedge, right, mm-hmm. gold, Bitcoin, land. 
Which of your students have had the most success? And like, can you quantify that success? Which of the who's had the most success? Your students. Students. Oh gosh, I've I got a lot of student success stories. Let me just um, think about the most recent one. Mm-hmm. So, I'll give you a couple examples. So, um, I was just at our live uh, boot camp where we do two and a half days of uh, training for our clients, and we have a program called Flight School where we take people through the program in real time and they start doing deals. So after the boot camp, I had a guy come up to me, very quiet the whole, the whole two and a half days. I, I barely know him, and he's like, "Hey, Mark, I, my uh, stepdad gave me your book, Dirt Rich," and he, I guess he'd had sort of a hard time when he was younger, and his dad, his stepdad's like, "Hey, I'm so proud of you, but if you now, if you want to make money, because he just graduated college, if you want to make money, read this book, and let it be your guide, and you'll become dirt rich." So he goes into flight school based on his stepdad's recommendation. A year later, he did $150,000 in cash deals. He's done just under a million in notes, and his cash flow is $13,500 a month. So that's one example. Um, someone who's been in a little bit longer, Roberto Chavez, is a, a full time attorney, young guy in his uh, late 20s, doesn't like working for the man. Um, he replaced his full-time income as a lawyer. He just quit his job. He's at over 20,000, I think 25,000 a month, maybe passive income now. And him and his fiance are traveling around the world. Um, We've had people retire their spouses. We've had people replace their income. We've had people, uh, you know, really move the needle in their life. So they, you know, the whole goal of this is to work when you want, where you want and with whom you want Mm -hmm. and just have total freedom and getting that passive income above the level of your fixed. Yeah. And have that passive income above. We, we did a, a podcast with a guy who's been doing it for five years. He's at $25,000 a month in, in passive income. Now, um, you know, we, we, we have someone who just bought, you know, he, he works with me, but he just upgraded his plane (laughs) So, you know, he, he's going to build a hangar, he, you know, an extra parcel. yeah, I mean, on, on the higher end, you, you can, you know, get up to the six figures a month. Um, but, you know, I, I want, I don't want people to think like, hey, this is get rich quick. It's not. This is get wealthy slow. And it's about having enough. Right. So for some people, enough is two thousand dollars a month. That will give them peace of mind. For other people, it's five thousand dollars a month. We say for all our clients. Let's get you to ten thousand dollars a month passive income. That's going to solve a lot of money problems. So, but once we have our money problem solved, also at the same time we want to solve our time problems. So we want to solve our money problems and our time problems. Have total freedom to then do what we really want to do in life. I mean, move up into Maslow's hierarchy of needs into self actualization. But most people are just hustling, 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 and trying to get you know just security and you know, they wake up one day like, well, is this all there is? Right. So why should someone not do this? Because you've, you know, made a compelling sales pitch on you and he's been running the numbers and, and thinking through it. So you wouldn't want to do this because you don't want to build a business. This is a business. Mm-hmm. Um, if you don't want to do that and you want something completely passive, um, you wouldn't want to do it. You would just, you know, for example, it's just easier to give your money to say a money manager, right? Um, totally passive. You get a return on your investment. Not if three hundred. This is actually probably, this is actually but. a business. So it's a simple model, but it ain't easy. What are the parts of it that are not easy? All of it. The whole thing is not easy. Um, you know, if we just start from the very beginning, right? There's three thousand seven U.S. counties. Where do you start? Right. So you got to start with a pick a county. You have to do county research. That's the first sort of brick wall. Your second brick wall is getting the list. Sometimes you got to buy a list. You have to go to like a datatree.com and get a list or listsource.com or, you know, some other site. It may, it's not so easy maybe to get it directly from the county. 
because we need it in a .csv or Excel file to use our software. Mm -hmm. Well, some of these counties are antiquated. So that's another brick wall is just getting the list. Now you got to do the work of looking at comparable sales, calling the assessor, finding out what, or going online, creating that spreadsheet, creating that pricing matrix, doing the math, dividing by four, importing that data into your list, right? Now you've got to upload that list. You got to start learning some software. The automation goes out. Now the offers come back. You have to deal with intake. You've got to call the seller. Hey, I got back your offer. It's We're going to close in seven days, contingent upon our research and due diligence. Then you've got to have the wherewithal to write a check. Hmm. That first time to write a check is tough. So now you got to start marketing. Again, if you've never done it. So, you know, all these little things are not easy. And then selling a piece of property is not easy. Then managing that note, we use a software called geekpay.io. It's a set it and forget it system that automates it. But you have to have the wherewithal to do it. So in the beginning, it's sort of like, you know, rocket fuel, right? 90% of getting a rocket up in the air is, is burning off all that fuel. But once it's up in, in the atmosphere, it only uses 10%. So we want to, you've, you've got to have that grit and determination to do it. So I would say that the biggest obstacle is do you have a burning desire, mm. right, for that? And if you don't, I don't judge. But for those that have a big why, you know, we've got a lot of clients that have children. They, you know, they don't see their kids. They're working all the time. This is a way for them to spend more time with their kids, more time with their family, develop deeper relationships, travel the world, do what they really want to do in life. But for other people, they don't have a, a burning enough desire. And that is their biggest obstacle is themselves. Yeah, I think that you're speaking directly to the problem that a lot of people in our age group face, which is like, where, where should you have that burning desire? Like, why don't I feel it? And, and I guess like if I, if I do feel it, is it right? You know? And so I think you're, you're speaking directly to something that people that would be listening to this show are, are feeling. Um, but now, yeah, I mean, we've got a client, Michaela Sorney. Um, she has a job she likes, but she's over $12,000 a month in passive income and doing six figures in cash flips. And she's 23. That's awesome. Good for her, for sure. She started in college. Yeah. Yeah. Well, for you, now that you're past that stage, uh, I guess like one, what do you have a burning desire for now? And then two, what now that you, you know, have all these systems automated, what are the important strategic decisions that you're making in order to, I guess, scale or level up your business? Yeah, so my why now is I want a mission to help everyone get out of what I call solo economic dependency. Will you, will you repeat which that? Which means if they're per soul, is it soul? So, oh, I'm sorry, solo, solo. economic okay. dependency, which means if they're not personally working, they're not making any money. They don't scale. It's a one-to-one. -one. Mm -hmm. So if you got a job, if you're self-employed, you know, think doctors, lawyers, right? Think about your dentist. If, if the dentist's hands aren't in somebody's mouth, they don't generate any income. So we want to eliminate subtle economic dependency. And so there's nothing more gratifying for me professionally than when someone comes up to me and says, Mark, you changed my life. And this is how, how my life looks now because of this, of this business and you helping me do that. Um, the second part is for me, you know, scaling my own land business. Well, it's been done. So I spend about 30 minutes uh, a week working in frontier properties, looking at the numbers, talking to the team and, um, you know, being a pain in somebody's side. Usually has anyone on your team gone and done this themselves as well, besides just like your students, if they're like this model that you're having me work and help you with seems pretty doable have they like started jumping out and trying it too i mean all my coaches they all have their own land business so everyone who's on my team started out in my training 
and kind of graduated and, and is now on the team. Now, as far as support people in the Philippines and Jamaica, um, they're not interested in the land business. So, no. Mm-hmm. One thing I, I saw you point out, either it's on your website or somewhere in our communications, is you have an A-plus with the Better Business Bureau. How does that, how do you like earn that? Is that something you apply for? Or do they just like do an audit and like you do a great job? And like, what's the significance of that? Yeah, so if you're listening to this Better Business Bureau, um, don't listen. Okay, so this is what you do. So the Better Business Bureau, it's kind of a, a thing, right? Um, you for apply whatever, for yeah. it for, for, for one year to get that seal. And it's like 450 bucks. And then they want to keep, keep charging you $450 a year. You only need the seal for one year put it, to put it on your website. Then after that, do right by people and don't have them call and report you. That's it. So I have a simple business philosophy, happy customers guaranteed. I have a 90-day additional due diligence policy. If they go out there, they don't love the property, I either refund them or exchange them for property that they do love. I have a 365-day exchange guarantee. So if they can't get out there in 90 days, I'll just exchange it for property they do love. We don't fight, we don't argue, make everybody happy, A plus rating. But no one calls to question it. No one calls a question. So once you have that rating, you would just advertise your seal on your website and then you just do right by people. That makes sense. Uh, Are there any kind of other fun advantages to owning land that like, besides just, you know, buying, selling and the making money aspect, but just having ownership of like a lot of space like, have you done yeah, anything I mean, fun with yeah. that? Like, I I personally, you know, like the idea of glamping. So I could imagine buying properties near state parks and then putting up, you know, cool tents on my land and, and renting it out and do like my own little Airbnb kind of thing. I haven't done it because I'm old, but if I were your Isaiah's age, that'd be a fun little revenue source uh, right there. So there's lots of things you can do, um, but I'm I'm mainly in the business of buying and selling raw land, so I personally don't go out there and enjoy it. But if I were, you know, a person that liked to ride horses or I liked to camp or like to fish or hunt, I'm just a geek. <laughs> I like being in front of my computer. Um, but if I were, I, I would enjoy it in my raw land. We've got a lot of people that are in our community and they love, you know, the, the land and they go out there and. They'll check it out and, you know, play on it. What has One been... thing we haven't asked about. Go ahead, Lewis. Yeah, I was going to ask, what is the, uh, you can kind of summarize this in short, but like the tax, we haven't talked about taxes at all. Like, where does that factor in? Like, yeah. Throughout the sale, great, the whole time, great question. at the end of the year, so, just how much you make, you take a percentage off. Yeah, so, so unfortunately, or fortunately, land is the only asset that lasts. So it does not depreciate. So when you flip that property, you are getting ordinary income. So depending on your tax bracket, if you're in the highest tax bracket, that's 40%. So there are ways to do this in what we call a qualified retirement plan. And that's check writing privileges. So there's no custodian. And then you have a SEP component, a self-employed piece and a Roth component. So you can buy and sell raw land in your Roth and it grows tax free Mm. or it can grow tax deferred if you want. Is that a strategy? There are, there are strategies to do it. No, that's not covering (laughs) the free course. That's, that's an advanced tactic. Yeah, that's advanced. Okay. Yeah. That's actually one of the things um, about multifamily real estate that I like so much is the way that depreciation makes your, um, you know, income negative, but your cash flow positive and the effect that has on taxes. And that was one of the things that, that drew me to multifamily. Um, and I mean, I don't own any multifamily, but I've worked in it the last couple of summers. And so that was one of the questions that I wanted to ask you is like, how does that work? And I guess that's the answer is that it's just taxed at regular ordinary income unless you use these other um, strategies like the Roth or, or um, whatever it may be, a, a really cr- creative right. CPA. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, we've got a lot of people who, who, who call the land investing business 
their gateway drug into multifamily and, and start doing the bigger deals. But they start because they don't have as much capital. Mm -hmm. So they start in land because you can, you can get started with 500 bucks. Yeah. Have I mean, you that's very sales? attractive. Yeah. Have you made sales to developers? Like people have built multifamily on your land. I don't know much about like the zoning, but has that like been a piece that you've encountered? Well, no, because you know, we're buying properties an hour to three hours outside of the city. So it's not really ready yet for development. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. And it's smaller parcels too, right? And so. And there's smaller parcels, yeah. Mm -hmm. But that's a, that's pretty amazing that you don't have to really. Oh, well, I guess this is another question. It's like, how much does zoning play into your decision making, um, if at all? If you're trying to sell it to a neighbor or. It or doesn't. It honest. doesn't. It, yeah, it doesn't really factor in for me. I don't want commercial property necessarily. But again, I'll buy any asset 25, 30 cents a dollar. Mm. I'll make it work. Right. Again, that's kind of the prerequisite from the first two or three minutes of this chat. That's kind of had to be in the back of everyone's head, like about the decisions that you're making. Right. Right. I think, yeah. I think we'll transition now to what we like to call the bonus round, just some rapid fire questions, less thematically themed. Uh, one of these, I can't even read what I wrote here. This seems really interesting though. Uh, have, I was going to ask, what are some other hobbies you have outside of like the land, your business, writing a book, teaching people, maybe some geek hobbies, maybe some non geek hobbies. Yeah. So I, I love to meditate. Um, so I'm constantly like every moment trying to be aware of my thoughts and my breath and grounding myself. So, you know, you guys are young, but when you get to be my age, uh, you're kind of more interested in the things that money can't buy. So I'm really interested in those things now. So I'm, I'm more interested in peace of mind. I'm more interested in, in a fit body. So, you know, I'll do yoga or I'll work out. I've got a Peloton, right? I've got a These Peloton are things the like too. hiking. Not mine though. You know, I, lo I love to be in nature and hike and um, I love the ocean and, and doing all those things. And then a house full of love, like, you know, it doesn't cost anything. So I, I wanted, you know, what are the things I can do to deepen my relationships um, and do that? And then how can I give back? So one of the fun things I like to do is I don't drink coffee anymore, but I'll still go to Starbucks and uh, and get like something for my kids in the drive-thru line. And every Monday I'll pay for the person behind me. And in my small little way, I think, oh, this little, you know, uh, good deed that yuppie might go into their job and be nicer to somebody and it'll just kind of like I want to be the pebble in the pond and like have that impact and it kind of ripples out type of thing maybe it doesn't I don't know because you know who knows but I, I like to think about that um, and then just you know different philanthropies of, of getting back uh, ball to all is uh, my mentor started that um, what's it called can you repeat it? Ball, is it ball to all.org or balls to all.org? Um, my mentor Ori started that. Um, it's indestructible soccer balls for like 10 bucks cool. in, in like these areas. It was really, it's still kind of my idea for world peace. I thought, well, if these kids are, you know, playing Xbox all day long, they won't get into trouble. It turns out in some of these areas, it's hard to get power. So he thought, well, soccer balls. So he's doing that. That's amazing. That's pretty awesome. Um, what have you changed your mind about recently? Everything. So my my whole th idea of my mind is that I literally know nothing. I always want to start the day with beginner's mind. Mm -hmm. So the only thing I'm truly certain about in life is that I don't know anything. So I'm constantly getting more and more information and analyzing it stress testing it for me and see if does this now that I have this new information, does this work better for me? Does this work worse for me? Um, in, in doing that. So I'm constantly sort of reevaluating any fixed position I have. I don't engage in politics. I don't read the news. Um, in fact, after this podcast, you guys can kind of tell me what's going on in the world. Apparently there's something going on with Afghanistan. They, the, or, uh, the Taliban. I wouldn't know. I don't really read the news because it's just depressing and I don't feel like I have any agency in there. Um, 
I'm not going to fly to Kabul and fight the Taliban, no matter what my position is, right? So, so that's kind of, you know, my, the, the, along with an answer is I'm constantly opening my mind to different ideas and seeing it do these work and, and apply for me. So you're going to build a bunker just as like a, just in case one day you check the news and it's really bad on one of these lands. No, I, I mean, no. you know, if it comes to the apocalypse, like, you know, Cause I've had a good life. It's probably like part of the strategy in most people's apocalypse plan. Yeah. I mean, we, yeah, we do have a lot of, uh, what we call preppers. These are people hoping for the best, preparing for the worst that buy our raw land and, and do some cool stuff with it. But for me personally, like, you know, I'm not really built for an apocalypse. Um, I'm not interested in doing all that. So I've had a good time on, on this planet, spinning around the blue marble. I'm good. Yeah, that's a great answer. Um, Is the... Sorry, I can't see Lewis. Lost my so it's, it's hard that's to get the, get the cues. Go for it, Lewis. Is the person who got you into this still doing this? If not, what are they doing, if you know? Yeah, so um, he is still doing it. Uh, absolutely. There's, there's a bunch of OGs. There's, yeah. What you'll find is with land investing, I talked to a guy. He's 78 years old. He has 3,500 notes. Um, I mean, I, he's got, you know, he's doing like 20 million a year. But he's been doing it forever. He's been doing it since the 80s. Um, no one really leaves the land business once they start. Eric Kyle. All you. Sounds like we just got to get started. Um, what has been your, your favorite deal that you've closed? Or do you have one? My favorite deal was, was um, I did a deal in Nevada, and it was with a public company. And they were only interested in the water rights. They weren't interested in the actual raw land. So I first I wanted to just test, you know, can I even sell this land? So I'm like, what's your worst land? And how much would you sell it to me for? Like, well, no one's going to be able to sell this land. It's 30 bucks an acre. I'm like, I'll take it. So I bought the property for 30 bucks an acre, a 640 acre parcel. I subdivided it into 40s and I started selling it at around $500 an acre. And everybody loved it. So I'm like, can I buy more? And they're like, sure. So it was like my first mil. I, I borrowed like a million dollars from them. Like the owner financed me. And over the next few years, I made over $5 million just on that one deal. That is... Is there sick. anything there now or it just has changed hands and it's subdivided? No, just, just changes hands. Yeah. That's pretty bizarre and interesting. This whole thing, there's just so much, so much to think about. Uh, do you, outside of land investing notes, this, you said the only type of investing, but maybe there's a one-off. Do you still do any investment banking? Have you thought about buying businesses? Do you have any interest in that? Or is that just not something that appeals to you? Yeah, I mean, every time I get, um, you know, shiny object syndrome, I do the math. And, you know, I, I write about this in the book. I do think I have the best passive income model. It's a one-time sale. I get recurring income. I have no headaches. The only thing better than what I think, than, than what my model is life insurance, right? Same thing, one-time sale, you get recurring passive income. But the great thing about life insurance is it's just an idea. The terrible thing about life insurance is you go to a party and no one wants to talk to you. And it takes 10 years to really move the needle in that business. Um, so lands, you know, you own an underlying asset, it lasts forever, you have nothing to maintain, nothing to protect, nothing physical. I just think it's the ultimate model. And again, guys, I'm open to something better. Mm -hmm. If you can think of it, right? I really am. I'm flexible like a yogi, <laughs> but I just, for me, I have not been in, exposed to anything better. And even though I might have some specific knowledge where I could probably, you know, flip businesses and do all that at the end of the day, I'm not interested in a 15% ROI on my money. I'm, I'm interested in 300 to a thousand percent. Absolutely. Um, what is the best County in the United States to buy raw land? I'm sorry, Kyle. Uh, I'm best County in the U S to buy raw land. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a trifle deaf in my left ear. 
You don't get to know that information. <laughs> he gave us the states. He gave I'm us very states. open. I'm very open, but not when it comes to you know my favorite county. We don't do your own research, everybody. Right. He'll give yeah. you the playbook, but not not his private keys. <laughs> exactly. There you go. That makes sense. So we're cl- coming into the end of it, so we might as well derail. Uh, why are you interested in Axie Infinity, and what is Axie Infinity for people who've never heard of it? So Axie Infinity is a game. I think there's a million people playing in it, but you know what they sell on Axie Infinity with Ethereum? Raw land, mm-hmm. virtual land. I like land. Do I really care if it's physical or virtual? No. Do I like the idea of the dollar when there's trillions, there's twenty-two dollars, twenty-two trillion dollars of debt? Cash is trash. I don't believe in the dollar, so I do like the idea of these, uh, the metaverse, um, the fact that you can, you know, if somebody said to me, "Hey, like my kids play, um, what's what's the game? It's is it Minecraft." Uh, no, no. You shoot them up. It's really cool. Fortnite. It's it was Fortnite. They play Fortnite. So this is kind of like imagine if you could, you know, they spent some, they sell like a million dollars a day in skins at Fortnite. So Axie Infinity allows you to be an investor in the game and own piece of the game. So if I can own a piece of Fortnite, that sounds pretty great. So is the gameplay right? similar in Axie? It's like similar gameplay, but with no, community it's more ownership? like Pokemon. Okay, it's, it's more like a Pokemon game, but. You know, again, it's just a game. People are fickle. It's just the idea of it that I like. That's more than the game. Mm-hmm. But it is gaining traction. Um, I do think there's a a component to it that is very similar to my model. That interests me. There are a few other. Have you I started keep... taking action on like buying? Enemies? No, because um, you know I'm ambitiously lazy, so. Uh, I'm personally probably not going to be the one to do that. I'm going to find the the expert who does it every single day and hire them. And here's my money. Go do it. To not how. Um, but there are a few companies that are doing that, like the Central Land, Sonium Space, or just two that are along those exact same lines of like raw land, and then you just develop it with code. And like you pay for every line and the, um, the stuff is trading for very, like a lot of money. Um, and people have become millionaires off of, of decentral land. And that's just like another level of insane. It's wild. Yeah. It, it's wild. But I mean, I mean, if you told me, Hey, would you invest in this company? It's, it's asking you, what are you doing in 140 characters or less? I'm like, no, that's not interesting at all to me. Well, that's Twitter. So I don't judge markets. If there's a market, it's a market. Now, there needs to be some intrinsic value, but that's that's the hard part of investing is, is finding out, you know, where is the real intrinsic value. Definitely. It wasn't Bitcoin and land, but there are a lot of similarities. Just, I don't yeah, Ge- Geek Pay, we're going to start hopefully – taking Bitcoin for our land payments. That's awesome. That's yeah. more than Jack Dorsey's done for in Square. real land. <laughs> yeah. So you're going to let people yeah. pay their monthly loan to you with Bitcoin? Correct. Is that an ambition or something that you've like put steps in motion to start doing? That's on the list. Okay. That's on the list. Yeah, we have a big feature list. That's very cool. Have you learned about the Lightning Network? Um, no. Tell okay. me. The Lightning Network, I'm going to do my best to not botch this, but it's a layer two on Bitcoin that seems to be a good solution for like lower cost transactions, faster transactions, just kind of like more practical use of Bitcoin for like payments. It's like a global payments network built on top of Bitcoin that reduces a lot of like the headaches of accepting Bitcoin as your like de facto transaction. So do they have an API? Probably. I got, we're getting way off the topic here, but I'm going to start running. I'm waiting for my raspberry Pi to get in and I'm going to start running my own lightning node. This is all the other equipment I need. Uh, I can send you the website. It's called Umbrella. They help you run your own node. 
I'm learning about the Lightning Network. You know, I'm sharing as I'm going, but that's that's part of the fun. But they're also like third. You don't have to like buy any. There's an app. Like there's definitely an app and a website version. You don't have to like build things yourself. For the people not on video, I just have a stack of Raspberry Pi and assorted hardware and like an external hard drive. But anyway, that might be a way to make whatever barriers you have run into in accepting Bitcoin potentially mitigated or reduced. Okay, awesome. I, I just checked it out. Now, it just, it's just light. Is it just lightning.network? No. Uh, it's like there are a lot of portals to doing it. So you'd probably like set up your own lightning wallet, have an address, then like, you know, have people send things to that address and like generate a, uh, I don't really know how you're doing it now. If it's like a recurring, I don't know if there's a recurring payment thing, but if, yeah, we, we know, need recurring payments like automated. I mean, I'm sure there's like, you know, you just configure that, right? You have so anyway, worth looking into. I don't, I'm not fully ready to, <laughs> I don't know enough to consult the full implementation, but if you're interested in Bitcoin, okay. this might be part of your solution stack. All right. And awesome. I'll leave it at that Thank you. as far as, cause that's the extent of, of what I know. Okay. Very cool. Yeah. If someone's listened to this podcast, should they still buy your book? Of course. Of course. What are some like topic areas? What's the sales pitch besides just yes, of course, like more details we didn't oh, get I into? Mean, just, it's just, you know, it, it, you know, when you, first of all, for me, like I want to hear something or see something or read something three different ways before I get it. So when you listen to me on the podcast, it's very different experience than reading it mm. and going through it through a book. It's also a very different experience going through a video and you know, going through that step by step as well. So the way I read actually is I'll get the audio book and the physical book. I'll listen to it on 2x speed and be fully immersed in it. So, you know, I, I don't want to just say blithely, you know, of course, you know, get the 99 cent Kindle book. Not that I want 99 cents. It's that I think that there's value in hearing this and reading this a different way in your own mind. And you might pick up something that we didn't talk about in the book. Your, my story might resonate with you in a different way because we didn't even really talk about my story in that, that much in depth where it is in the book. And then you kind of go down that rabbit hole from things in the book as well. So, um, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I love books for sure. I finally remember the question that I was upset that I lost. Uh, the personal hourly rate is something that's come up a couple times in our podcast with various guests. How do you kind of get to the point where you're, cause there's kind of a very difficult transition stage of, you know, deciding you're worth like this ambitious number and then like painfully paying for a lot of stuff to free up your time, but it always ends up being worth it in the end. How do you kind of coach people to setting that number and transitioning to like living in tune with it? It's a really, in-depth question perfect i'm glad we're right it's at the, really, towards I mean, the edge of our time it, when i ask it okay so you've got to look at you know the math you want to do right now is okay what is my current hourly rate so once you have clarity on that then you start eliminating everything in your life that is costing you money so for example if your current hourly rate is twenty dollars an hour Right. And um, you're, it costs you an hour to do your own gardening, let's say. And you don't love gardening. So it's not, you're not just doing it for the joy of it, the hobby of it. You know, your parents are like, hey, go, go pick the weeds. Right. And it's going to take you an hour. And you can go hire Timmy, the neighbor, for $10 an hour. You've just made net $10 of time. And again, we can always make more money. We can't get more time. The idea being with that extra $10 that you've made of time, how can you reinvest it? So if you're just going to play video games, go, go pull the weeds, right? But if you're going to use it to go in depth into a topic that's read the maybe going to make you read dirt, rich, read the book, read the book, dirt, rich, listen to a podcast, that can we, will expose you, make you aware of different ways to earn more money. Well, you just keep laddering up your hourly rate. 
So it's you just keep laddering it up, laddering it up, laddering it up. But you need to be fully cognizant of where you're at today and then where you want to be. And then just say, you know, you get to one some point in life like, well, I'm not going to do anything mm-hmm. unless it's, you know, like I, I won't even park my car. I'm not going to spend five minutes looking for a parking spot. I'll valet park. Right? Because it, I'm losing money. Yeah. Doing that. So, but when you're younger, it's very, very difficult to do because you have so much, you or you perceive to have so much time when in reality, I forget how many weeks we really have in life. The average person lives to 4,000. It's like 4,000 weeks. So it's like, okay, you got, you know, the, it's not that long. Do you, you know, so you got to just be, I think just having that awareness and then, you know, I love that Derek Sivers quote. If it's not a hell yeah, it's a no. And and do that. But when you're young, you kind of reverse that. Like you just look at, you just start doing everything. You, you take every opportunity and then you start being a little bit, you start filtering. So it depends where you are in life. But you want the trifecta in life, essentially. So when you're young, you've got time, you've got health, but you're broke. That sucks, right? You get to middle age, you've got money, you got health, the kids are killing, you got no time, right? And then when you're older, you got money, you got time, you're retired, but unfortunately your health is is, is on the decline. So how do we shortcut our lives so we have the trifecta as soon as possible? So we have that money, the health, and the time. Buying land's the answer. An answer. A very good answer. Thank you, Kyle. Or thank you, Lewis. If somebody is listening to this podcast and wants to know more about you, more about uh, how to invest in land, other than buying your book, Dirt Rich, where should they go and what should they do? I think the best place to start is thelandgeek.com and just start there. Absolutely. Great. Thank you so much. And that wraps up our interview with Mark, the land geek. It was a super interesting conversation for me as I'm very interested in real estate. And, you know, I told him before that the land is usually the first thought and then everything else after that has nothing to do with the land. I mean, it's very, very important to a piece of real estate, but like, it's just sort of the weather at some point, you can't change it. It's where it's at. And so nobody really, really talks or thinks about it. And, and maybe that's wrong, but he thinks a lot about it and it's all he does. And so it was super cool to talk to somebody who's just trading land all day. Um, my takeaways were, you know, I think a big piece of his model is that he closes in seven days. That's an incredibly short amount of time relative to like industry standard. And so his ability to put that on a piece of paper, tell them, uh, tell the, the seller like, Hey, I'm going to do this in seven days. You're going to get the cash in your bank account is an incredible um, tool for him. And, and a lot of the reason I think why he gets some of those low, um, low offer acceptances. Um, and then another thing is no is inevitable. You know, he gets no's all the time. He sends out thousands of offers. Uh, I don't know how, what his cadence is, but probably thousands of offers a month. And most of those are no, I think he said he gets a 3% hit rate and that's just a response. So that's not even, that's not even an acceptance. Um, and so you're going to face that no matter what, but sending those offers and, and getting in the game and being there is, is the most important thing. And then the last thing is about just the model in general. Um, you know, he thinks it's, a, it's the best model for generating passive income and it certainly is for him. Right. But there are so many models out there in real estate in business, operating businesses, small businesses, uh, you know, just picking up a trade, working as an accountant, like it's just, there are so many different, um, ways you can go in life. And as I am, you know, 21 and going to graduate at the end of this year, I'm considering all those things. And, and it's just another, another good option. Um, and I think it's important to evaluate the, the different models in front of you and pick whichever one you believe has the most leverage. And this one seems to have, you know, some really good leverage. And so those are my takeaways. Uh, Lewis, what'd you think? Yeah, you gave me an idea unrelated to my takeaways, just the kind of, you have to come up with a unique differentiator. You know, there's so many different ways you can skew value to like stand out from everyone else. And the one that you brought up that he does, right, is that seven day close. So there might be a lot of other people trying this that aren't closing in seven days. 
and you can kind of just think you only have to make one value skew, you know, to, to be quote unquote innovative and competitive. So that was just something you made me think of before I'm going to get into what I had written down first was the discussion of the hourly rate, right? If you're making any amount of money, that's, you can roughly price, you know, you're making X per year, you're making X per hour, anything that you can do to save an hour of time that costs less than you make per hour. You should start automating free up time, free up your life. This whole episode was about value from leveraging scarcity. Your time's very scarce. You should think about his relationship with money and work on escaping what he calls solo economic dependency, being reliant on one source of income and relying on your productive effort to create that income. Second, uh, kind of another iteration on the, just how interesting that line was money loves speed. So a $2,500 offer for that you might get in the next 90 days. Eh. But if you're like that eh, 2,500 bucks and I'll have it by the end of the weekend, that changes people's minds. Uh, and so that kind of is one example of his business philosophy of having happy customers. I really like that way of doing things. Just do right by people. And most problems that other people complain about having won't come to you because no one hates you because you've done right by people. Third, uh, was I'm always a sucker for just like a good, you know, quip, a good one-liner. If you, uh, want to listen to our episode with Cole Schaefer, he's a copywriter who's got some of like the very best one-liners. Anyway, he said, you know, there's a pig for every barn. I really like that expression. This is my third takeaway. I've never heard that before, but it's kind of like a way of saying, don't shit on any market that you don't understand kind of thing. Like, I don't understand why all these people still want to go to, I don't know, like some restaurant that you like hate the food and you think it tastes bad and it smells bad, but there's like always a line out the door. Uh, let's give an example. Like there's a restaurant in Tuscaloosa called Cookout that I've never really understood why everyone's all about it and why at 3 a.m. on a weeknight there's people there and waiting an hour in a drive through for subpar food. But, you know, there is. Uh, there's a pig for every barn. So he's like, I don't understand why anyone would want this, but somebody did it and was going to pay. I thought it was going to be a terrible deal and it was like 100x better than my usual deals. So the point is, everyone has their own set of interests. Don't assume that your interests are the same interest as the markets. That's all I have to say for this episode with Mark, the Land Geek. I'm considering buying his audiobook because I have a road trip coming up. And on Audible, it is less expensive than a credit. It's one of those audiobooks pro tip. If the book is less than $15, you should probably buy it for cash and save your credit. And so that's what I'm going to do. And if you're interested in his content, I encourage you to do the same. Otherwise, as Kyle said at the beginning of this episode, we publish a new episode roughly every single week. So you should check back here in roughly one week for another episode. Otherwise, be good. See you then. Bye-bye.